Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, we're going to be covering part two of priority and delegation of multiple patients. Now, if you haven't watched part one already, I encourage you to watch part one first and then go ahead and watch uh, this video, which is part two. Before we get started, as always, I'm going to ask you to please support me and support this channel by liking this video. You know you're going to love it. Press that um, like button now so you don't forget. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already and press the red notification button so you'll be notified every single time a new video is release. Please don't forget, I'm now offering Next Generation NCLEX reviews. I'm offering tutoring sessions and one-on-one -on -one consultations if needed. Also, as always, you can grab yourself one or many audio lessons. You can book for a review. You can book for a tutoring session. You can grab an audio lesson all on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. Before we get started, I always want to start off with a prayer. If you're not into that, that's not a problem. Just fast forward. If you are, close your eyes by your head. Father God, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for all that you've done for us. Thank you for another opportunity you've given us to go over this nursing information, Father God. Lord, we ask for forgiveness for our sins because we know we, shot, we fall short of your glory every single second. But thank you, God, for allowing us to even come before your throne and ask for forgiveness, knowing that before the words are even out of our mind, out of our um, mouth, with a sincere heart, it's already been given. So thank you for that, Lord. Father God, I pray for every single listener, every single viewer at this moment, for whatever reason they came to this channel. Lord, I ask that you please bless them in abundance. Help them to understand the information. Help them to be able to recognize these concepts, if they see it again, to be able to think through them critically, help them to answer their questions correctly, Jesus. And Father God, when they're successful, when they've obtained their license, when they've graduated, please allow them to be a blessing to others. Thank you for all that you've done for us and all that you'll continue to do in our lives. In Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. All right, guys, let's get started. Now, here's what I'm going to do. Since it's part two, I'm going to re-review the instructions. I'm going to re-review the clinical uh, situation so you can have an idea of what's going on, just in case you forgot, and then we'll get started. So here's what's going on. It says, the registered nurse is the leader of a team providing care for six clients. The team includes the RN, that's the registered nurse, an experienced LPN slash LVN and a newly educated unlicensed assistive personnel who is in his fourth week of orientation to the acute care unit. The clients are as follows. Mr. C, a 68 year old man with unstable angina who needs reinforcement teaching for cardiac catheterization scheduled this morning. Ms. J, a 45 year old woman who had chest pain during the night and is now experiencing chest pain. She's scheduled for a graded exercise test later today. Mr. R, a 75-year-old man who had a left hem hemisphere stroke four days ago. Ms. S, an 83-year-old woman with heart disease, history of myocardial infarction and mild dementia. Mr. B, a 93-year-old newly admitted man from a long-term care facility with decreased urine output, altered level of consciousness, elevated temperature of 99.5. And Mr. L, a 59-year-old man with mild shortness of breath and chronic emphysema. All right, so here is our first question. The UAP is delegated the task of measuring morning vital signs for all six clients. Which finding would the nurse instruct the UAP to report immediately? One, oral temperature higher than 102. Two, blood pressure higher than 140 over 80. Three, heart rate lower than one, uh, excuse me, heart rate lower than 65 beats per minute or four respiratory rate lower than 18 breaths per minute. And guys, the correct answer is number one, the temperature higher, higher than 102. So again, whenever you get a test question about what patient are you gonna assess first, right? You have to think of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. What is going to kill or harm your patient the fastest? What is it? It's gonna be that temperature, fever. Look at the other choices we have in front of us. Choice two, blood pressure higher than 140 over 80. Well, it's, it's at least there's still a little bit left in that parameter because your normal is 90 over 60 to 140 over what? 90. Choice number three, heart rate lower than 65. Well, guess what? The normal is 60 to 100. Number four, respiratory rate lower than 18 breaths per minute. Normal is 12 to 20. So the only one that is number one outside of that parameter and number two will harm the patient the fastest is gonna be that temperature of 102. What are we concerned about? Infection. 
The UAP asked the RN why it's important to notify someone whenever a client with heart problems reports chest pain. What is the RN's best response? One, it's important to keep track of chest pain episodes so we can notify the healthcare provider. Two, the client may need morphine to treat the chest pain. Three, chest pain may indicate coronary artery bl uh, blockage and heart muscle damage that will need treatment. Four, our unit policy includes specific steps to take in the treatment of clients with chest pain. Even though all of these statements are true, all of these statements are important, the question is, why? Why is it so important? And so when we're looking at an answer, we're gonna look for something that's a priority. Again, what will kill our patient the fastest? What will cause more harm? And when you think about it, what is chest pain? Chest pain, when the patient's having chest pain, they're having angina, that is the heart muscle that's screaming, help me, help me. Why is it saying help me? Because I'm not getting enough oxygen. Why aren't you getting enough oxygen? Well, guess what? There's not enough blood flow because remember oxygen is being carried in hemoglobin that's being carried in the RBC that's being carried in the blood, right? So if there's some kind of blockage, something's happening that the heart muscle itself is not getting the oxygen that's being delivered in the blood through the coronary arteries, by the way, but it's not getting it, that's gonna cause the patient to have that chest pain. Three, chest pain may indicate coronary artery damage. It's the coronary arteries that supply oxygenated blood to the heart muscle itself and heart muscle damage that will need treatment. Now, let's look at the wrong answer choices. One, it's important to keep track of the chest pain episode so we can notify the healthcare provider. That's true. You want to notify the healthcare provider, but at the end of the day, if we have to choose one answer why it's so important, that's not it. Because notifying that uh, the, the healthcare provider, that is not what is actually killing or harming our patient. Always, guys, you've got to bring it back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Choice number two, patient may need morphine to treat the chest pain. Guess what? That morphine that you're giving them, that will help the patient, that will ease the pain. But it's not, number one, it's not going to um, actually make, the. Uh, it's not going to fix that underlying problem. The underlying problem is that patient, the heart muscle itself, not getting enough oxygen. Choice number four, our unit policy. Okay, it very well may be the unit policy, but that's not why it's so important to notify someone when a patient's having chest pain. The reason it's important to notify someone when the patient's having chest pain is because that chest pain is indicative of a bigger problem, a problem that can do what to the patient? Kill the patient. Physiological integrity. It comes down to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. What is going to kill your patient? Priority is always going to be the under these underlying causes such as heart problems. Or if you don't see, guys, here's another thing. You're looking at your list of symptoms, right? Or you're looking at your list of answers and you don't see any answers that fall under physiological integrity, but you may see a symptom that leads to something that falls under physiological integrity, just like the chest pain. The chest pain leads to heart problems. And guess what? Heart problems falls under physiological integrity because can you live without your heart? No, you cannot, right? So those vital signs such as the apical heart, blood pressure, hemodynamic status, um, airway breathing circulation, nutrition, glucose, fluids and electrolytes, things that physiologically keep your patient alive is always going to be uh, uh, the priority. All right, moving on. The healthcare provider uh, prescribed interventions for Mr. R, who had a stroke four days ago, include, uh, include assisting the client with meals. Which staff member would be best to assign this task? Would it be a physical therapist, a UAP, an LPN, LVN, or an occupational therapist? Now, let me go back to read Mr. R's situation, and I'll read the question to you again, just so you have a clear understanding. So for Mr. R... What's going on with Mr. R? I'm going to read this to you again. Mr. R, this is a 75-year-old man who had a left hemisphere stroke four days ago. 75-year-old man had a left hemisphere stroke four days ago. Here's the question. The healthcare providers prescribed interventions for Mr. R, who had a stroke four days ago, includes assisting the client with meals. Which staff member would be best to assign to this task? Would it be the physical therapy? the physical therapist, the UAP, the LPN slash LVN, or the occupational therapist? What are you gonna choose? 
And guys, the correct answer is to the UAP. And I know what some of you are thinking. You're saying to yourself, but wait a minute, Professor D. You said a patient that had a stroke may have um, deficiencies, right, physiologically. And so the first time that they ambulate and the first time that they're eating, the registered nurse has to ambulate the patient. The registered nurse has to feed the patient so they can assess the patient to see if they have to call the healthcare provider for orders such as physical therapy or occupational therapy or speech therapy. Yes, I did say that and that's true. I stand 10 toes down on it. Here's the key. Go back to the question, how long ago did the patient have a stroke? Four days ago. So you mean in four days, you don't think that patient ate anything four days later and this is the first time they're eating? Of course not. So that means initially after the stroke, that first meal, yes, the registered nurse fed the patient because the registered nurse was assessing the patient to see if they had any issues swallowing, if there was possible aspiration, if the patient needed a swallow study, all of that. It's now four days later. So because the registered nurse did the initial feeding, it's four days later, of course, they can delegate that to the UAP because we know UAPs do lots of things, including ADLs and feeding patients. That's why we can give it to the UAP. Number two is the correct answer choice. So you guys have to be very careful. Read the question closely and you gotta use your critical thinking skills. The LPN LVN reports to the RN that Mr. R was unable to take his oral medications because of difficulty swallowing. We're talking about the same patient here. The RN assesses Mr. R and finds that he's having dysphagia. What is the RN's best instruction for the LPN or LVN? One, keep Mr. R NPO and I'll contact the healthcare provider. Two, try giving his medications with applesauce pudding. Three, check with the pharmacy to find out if they have liquid forms of Mr. R's medication. Four, assess Mr. R's ability to speak and move his tongue. And guys, the correct answer is one. You're going to instruct your LPN to keep that patient NPO because we're seeing he's having problems swallowing and we don't want him to aspirate. We don't want to cause a bigger problem before you know this patient has pneumonia, right? We're not trying to deal with any of that. So we're going to have the patient NPO and then you, the RN, you're going to place the help of the call to the healthcare provider. Remember, I told you uh, the differences of what the RN is responsible for versus the LPN versus the UAP. And one of the responsibilities for you, the registered nurse, nurse, you have to be the one to call the healthcare provider to ask for orders such as, you know, speech therapy, occupational therapy, physical therapy. So you're going to tell the LPN mm -mm, and PO while I call the healthcare provider, tell them what's going on and get orders. So the correct answer is number one, we want to make sure that the patient doesn't aspirate. Now let's look at the wrong answer choices. Two, Try giving his medications with applesauce pudding. Oh, you crazy. You crazy, crazy. You mean to tell me that the LPN just came to you and tell you that the patient can't take their own medications because they're having trouble swallowing and your response is to send... First of all, let me stop right there. Whenever you get a test question and somebody, LPN, CNA, UAP, I don't care. They come to you to tell you about your patient that you're ultimately responsible for as a registered nurse. You never send them back to do anything for the patient. You go deal with it, right? So in, if a nursing intervention is going to be done for that patient, you're going to do it. You're not going to send them back to go try applesauce. Absolutely not. That patient's going to be NPO. We're not trying to lose our license. Let's keep going. Um, three, Check with the pharmacy to find out if they have liquid for forms of Mr. R's medications. Oh, so now, number one, we're playing doctor because we're trying to change the form of medication that's given. And number two, we turn into a killer because that's what we're trying to do right now. We're trying to kill our patient. We're trying to get them to aspirate so they can ch choke and they can die and so we can lose our license. That makes no sense. You are not going to do that. And then choice number four, assess Mr. R's ability to speak and move his tongue. So you're going to send your LPN to go back and assess the patient that they just told you had the problem? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. If you're going to tell your patient, your LPN to do anything, you're going to tell them to stop doing something such as stop feeding that patient. Let's stop. Put that patient NPO and I, the registered nurse who's responsible for all of these patients, I'm going to, going to go call the healthcare provider. Number one is the correct answer.
The UAP reports to the RN that Mr. L, I'll read you his situation in a second. Mr. L, the client with chronic emphysema, says he's feeling short of breath after walking to the bathroom. What action should the RN take first? Here are your choices. One, notify the healthcare provider. Two, increase oxygen flow to six liters via nasal cannula. Three, assess oxygen saturation by pulse oximetry. Or four, remind the client to cough and deep breathe. Let's talk about L for, Mr. L for a second. I need to remind you of his situation. Mr. L, this is the 59 year old man with shortness of breath and chronic emphysema. That's what's going on with him. He's 59 years old, he has shortness of breath and he has chronic emphysema. Now let's go back to the question about him. It says that the UAP reports to the RN that Mr. L, the client who had chronic emphysema, is feeling short of breath after walking to the bathroom. What is our RN gonna do first? One, notify this to the healthcare provider. Two, increase oxygen flow rate to six liters uh, per minute via nasal cannula. Three, assess oxygen saturation by pulse ox. Or four, remind the client to cough and deep breathe. What's your answer? And the correct answer, the only correct answer here, guys, is going to be three. You're going to assess the pulse ox, right? Yeah. Um, preferably, we would love the pulse ox to be between 98 and 100, but anything from 95 to 100 is acceptable. What you're going to do is assess the um, pulse ox. That's what we're going to look at. Let's look at the wrong answers. One, notify the healthcare provider and tell the healthcare provider what? That your UAP came to you and told you the patient was short of breath? You don't have a pulse ox. You didn't listen to the lung sounds. You don't have respiration numbers. You don't have blood pressure. You don't have heart rate. You have nothing. What do you want to tell the healthcare provider? Absolutely nothing. Wrong. Uh, choice two. Look at choice two, increase flow rate to six liters. This patient has COPD, they have emphysema, right? So we are not going to increase that patient's oxygen. You know what happens, right? So absolutely not. That's contraindicated as a matter of fact. Choice four, remind the client to cough, deep breathe. That's wonderful. That actually is a great nursing assessment, uh, not assessment, a uh, great nursing intervention, a great nursing teaching, but that's not going to be our priority if we can only choose one thing to do. We're gonna check that O2 sat first. We're gonna assess our patient first. Then of course, wonderful, we can teach our patient, tell them to make sure that they cough and deep breathe. We wanna clear up any secretions, great. But the first thing we're gonna do is assess our patient. I keep telling you guys, most of your test questions are based on one of these three. ABC at Pi Maslow's hierarchy of needs. This was a at Pi question. You assess your patient first before you perform a nursing intervention. The oral temperature of Mr. B, the client that was newly uh, admitted from a long-term care facility with decreased urine output and altered level of consciousness is now having a temperature of 102.6 degrees. What is the nurse's best action? One, notify the healthcare provider. Two, administer a sediment, two tablets orally. Three, um, ask the LPN or LVN to give an acetamin, acetamin suppository. Or four, remove extra blankets from the client's bed. What are you going to choose? Number one, call the healthcare provider. Now, here's what's so wonderful. If you look at the question, it t t lets you know, this is an ad pie question, by the way, right? You've assessed your patient. That's how you know they have um, decreased your output. That's how you know they have altered level of consciousness. That's how you know that temperature is now 102.6. You actually have something to tell the healthcare provider. You've assessed your patient. Next, you're going to call the healthcare provider to get orders. Now, the fact that Mr. B, let's, let me read Mr. B's situation to you because I'm going to make a point to you in a second. So it says, Mr. B, this is a 93-year-old newly admitted man from a long-term care facility with decreased urine output, altered level of consciousness, and elevated temperature 99.5. Originally, the temperature was 99.5. Look at what's going on now. It's 102.6. The fact that this is an older patient. The fact that they're coming from a long-term care facility. The fact that they have a temperature. The fact that they have a change in the level of consciousness. What are we suspecting here? UTI, infection. And I say UTI because I see the decreased urine output, but let's say the decreased urine output wasn't there and we saw all these other signs and symptoms. At the minimum, we would suspect an infection. 
right? What is the first sign and symptom of infection in an older adult? Confusion. You've done this assessment. You know something's wrong with the patient. You better call the healthcare provider and get orders. Let's look at the wrong answer choices. Two, administer acetaminophen two tablets orally. So you're going to ignore the problem and just cover it up with acetaminophen, assuming that it's already been ordered PRN, right? Choice three, ask the LPN to give acetaminophen suppository. So I already talked to you about giving acetaminophen. Let's talk about something's wrong with the patient acutely right now. Something's wrong with the patient and you sending someone else to go do something for your patient. Remember, when it comes to the LPNs, we're, gi we're giving them the most stable patient with the most predictable outcome. Not this patient who's newly admitted, who currently actively has something going on with them right now. No. Four, remove extra blankets from the client's bed. So that's your solution to the fever. That's your solution to the change of the level of consciousness. That's your solution to the decreased urine output. You're letting a test writer know that you have no clue what's going on here. You're going to call the healthcare provider with your findings. Which factor does a nurse suspect most likely precipitated Mr. B's temperature elevation? I'm sorry, guys. I gave you guys the answer. Is it one, bladder infection, two, increase a metabolic rate, three, kidney failure, or four, nosocomial pneumonia? And I know you guys know what the correct answer is. And it's one, you suspect a bladder infection. Sorry about that. I got ahead of myself. The RNs working on a care plan for Mr. B, so this is the same patient we've been talking about. Which care intervention is most appropriate to delegate to the UAP, the unlicensed assistive personnel? One, checking the level of consciousness. Two, assisting with ambulation to the bathroom to urinate. Three, teaching the client about side effects of antibiotic therapy. Or four, administering um, sulfamethoxyl. It's an antibiotic. I'm not even going to try to pronounce that uh, medication. Uh, orally every 12 hours. You guys know I can't pronounce. You, you know this if you've been watching me for any amount of time. All right. The correct answer, guys, is two. That's the only thing that you can give to the UAP. UAPs can do lots of things, but they cannot teach. They cannot assess. They cannot evaluate. If it's something that requires critical thinking. I'm not saying they can't think critically. That's not what I'm saying. I just want you thinking this way. If it requires critical thinking, you can't delegate that to the UAP. So you can't do number one because checking is another way of assessing or evaluating. Choice number three, teaching. They cannot teach. They can remind. They can behind. They can come behind the RN or the LPN and say, Mr. Such and Such, remember the nurse said to do this. Remember the nurse said to do that. They can remind, but they can't teach. And then choice number four, giving a medication. They cannot give medications. They cannot do dressing changes. So the correct answer is two. They can ambulate the patient to the bathroom. They can ambulate. They can feed patients. They can dress patients. They can comb their hair. They can do lots of things, but they cannot teach. They cannot give medications. They cannot assess. So number two is the correct answer choice. The UAP reports that Mr. L's heart rate, which was 86 beats per minute in the morning, is now 98 beats per minute. What would be the most appropriate question for the nurse to ask Mr. L? One, have you just returned from the bathroom? Two, did you recently use your albuterol inhaler? Three, are you feeling short of breath? Or four, how much do you smoke? Let's go back to Mr. L's clinical situation. Let me explain it to you. So it says, Mr. L, Mr. L is a 59 year old man with mild shortness of breath and chronic emphysema. Emphysema is a type of COPD. So that's what we're dealing with. A 59 year old man with mild shortness of breath and chronic emphysema. The UAP comes to you and reports that Mr. L's heart rate, which was 86 in the morning is now 98. What's the most appropriate um, question to ask the patient? One, have you just returned from the bathroom? Two, do you recently use your albuterol inhaler? Three, are you feeling short of breath? Four, how much do you smoke? And the correct answer is two. Did you recently use your albuterol inhaler? This patient's um, um, heart rate has gone up. 
We know they have emphysema, right? So you're gonna ask them, hey, did you just take your albuterol? Because what's one thing we know about albuterol? It can cause tachycardia, it can cause increased heart rate, right? And so that's what we're gonna ask this patient. And so what should have led you to that question about albuterol, number one, the fact that the patient has emphysema, and number two, we know that among the many things albuterol does, it increases the heart rate. Look at number one, have you just returned to the bathroom? That's actually the second question you would ask the patient. If you ask them, hey, have you just taken your albuterol? And they're like, no, I didn't. Your next question was like, okay, did you just come from the bathroom? Were you walking around? Because remember, they have emphysema. When you move around, the demand for oxygen is increased. In the patient that has emphysema, their oxygen demand still is gonna be increased. They just don't have the oxygen to give the body. So what happens, the heart tries to compensate and we'll see the heart rate go up because it's trying to push more oxygenated blood to the tissues. So after we've asked them, hey, have you just had your albuterol treatment? If they say no, the next question should be, okay, were well, you moving around? Did you go to the bathroom? To see if their oxygen demand increased and maybe that's what was causing the increased heart rate. Choice three, are you feeling short of breath? We know they're short of breath. They have mild shortness of breath from the emphysema. It told us that in the patient's clinical picture. So why would we ask them that? We know that already. Four, how much do you sp smoke? Even if they smoke nothing, we knew they were smoking a lot. They have emphysema, right? So the important question is really to find out, okay, what's causing this increase in the heart rate? And the first question you really should have asked was, you know, did they take the albuterol um, recently? The LPN LVN reports to the RN that Ms. S will not leave the chest leads for her cardiac monitor in place and asks if the client can be transferred. What is the RN's best response? One, yes, the client had a heart attack and we must keep her on a cardiac monitor. Two, yes, but be sure to use soft restraints so that the client's circulation is not compromised. Three, no, we must have a healthcare provider's order before we can restrain in any situation. Or four, no, but try covering the lead wires with the sheet so that the client does not see them. So Miss S, I'm going to remind you what's going on with her. Miss S, where are you Miss S? I don't see Miss S. Okay, Ms. S, that's the 83-year-old woman with heart disease, has a history of myocardial infarction and mild dementia. Okay, so she's acting up doesn't want to keep her leads on, what do we do? The correct answer, guys, is four. No, we can't put her in restraints. But try covering the lead wires with sheets so that the client does not see them. Why? Before you can put a patient in restraints, you have to uh, try alternate methods. And according to this situation, we haven't tried any alternate methods. You can't just jump into restraints. You have to try alternate methods first. And you have to document the alternate methods that you tried and the results, right? Because you have to prove that, hey, I tried these methods first before I had to put the patient in restraints. So of course, the correct answer. You have to try different methods or strategies first. You can't just jump to restraints. Now let's look at the wrong answer choices. One, yes, this client had a heart attack and we must keep her on the cardiac mo monitor. Yeah, you got to keep her on the cardiac monitor, but you have to try all, uh, alternate strategies first before you jump into restraints. Two, yes, but be sure to use soft restraints. Guess what? Soft restraints are still restraints. You have to try alternate strategies first. Look at three, and I know all three tripped a couple of you guys up. No, we must have a healthcare provider's order before we can apply restraints in any situation. That's not true. We know um, emergencies happen. You have to have that order within 24 hours of the restraint. No, I'm actually, I'm lying. You have to have the order within one hour of the restraint and the healthcare provider has to physically assess the patient within 24 hours of the order, okay? So if you have to, you restrain your patient, but you have to have an order to cover that restraint within one hour, right? And the healthcare provider has to physically assess, physically see that patient within 24 hours of the order um, for the restraint, because restraints are only good for 24 hours and then they have to be renewed, okay? So four is the correct answer. And guys, we are down to our last question. Near the end of the shift, the LPN slash LVN reports that the UAP has not totaled the client's intake and output for the past eight hours. What is the nurse's best action? Is it one, confront the UAP and instruct them to complete the assignment at once? 
Two, assign this task to LP and LVN. Three, ask the UAP if he needs assistance completing the intake and output records. Four, notify the nurse manager to include this on the UAP's evaluation. What's your answer? And the correct answer is three. Guys, whenever there's an issue with staff, unless the patient's being harmed, they're being, you know, abused or, you know, um, their medications being diverted or the person who's caring for that patient is under the influence, there's potential for that patient harm, you're going to go directly to that staff member. The only time you go above their head is when, you know, the patient can be harmed. Like I said, you know, they're being abused or the person caring for them is under the influence or whatever. Okay. So when the LPN comes to you, the RN and says, hey, my UAP haven't done the INOs for all eight hours, go to the UAP. And let me, let me read this back to you. I want to remind you of something. Your UAP is in their fourth week of orientation. They are new. They're new. So you're going to go to them and say, hey, do you need some help? And you get them that help, that support. They are still learning. Look at the wrong answer choices. One, stop and confront. We don't confront in nursing. Okay. So stop right there. You know, it's wrong. Two, assign the task to the LP and LVN. Well, you know what? If that was the case, nobody would do any. Nobody would do their work because they knew if they didn't do their work, it would be passed on to somebody, someone else, right? So you don't just tell the LPN, okay, well, you do the UAP's job. No, your job as a registered nurse is to assess, get information, go to the source, go to the UAP and say, hey, do you need some help? What's going on? Get information. Choice number four, notify the nurse manager. So you're not even going to talk to the UAP. You're not even going to assess the situation, see what the problem is, see if they need some help. You're just going to jump to that, going to the nurse manager to put on the UAP's evaluation. You're not going to have staff along. Okay, so number three is the correct answer. And guys, that is the end of this video. That was our last question. Please let me know what you thought about this video. Let me know if you'd like to see more priority and, dele uh, pri priority and delegation questions. Um, don't forget, I have the NCLEX Next Generation Reviews that you can book on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. I'm now tutoring. I'm offering private tutoring. Now, I have to warn you, um, my spots for avail availability, they book very quickly. Like, I open up a spot within, within an hour, hour and a half it's booked. So I'm telling you that it books very fast. So you got to keep checking the website for availability if you'd like tutoring sessions, but they are available and audio lessons. All of those you can find on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. Don't forget almost daily, you can find me covering a variety of nurse, nursing topics such as, um, well, variety of nursing topics, but the platforms, TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. Guys, thank you so much for watching this video. You guys catch me on the next video.